Hello, everybody. Welcome to another Joy of SharePoint webinar. My name is Joy Apple. I am with Pate Group, and I have with me, okay, I find I'm going to say it out loud, one of my favorite co webinar presenters, Stephen Wilson. He How has. How painful is that? <laughs> I mean, I don't want that ego to get so huge. Let's be real. Yeah. <laughs> But Stephen recently wrote a really awesome blog. Um, and I think I'm going to try here in a minute to put that in the chat for you all because it's fantastic. I got uh, you covered. Oh, Stacy's got it. She's amazing. I have the best coworkers at Pate Group. But it is Office 365, a security plan. And then because he's just a wild and crazy man, he also subtitled it Rubber Baby Buggy Bumpers. Oh my gosh, I actually said it the first time. <laughs> Stephen, what was your inspiration for that? For the rubber baby buggy bumpers or the blog yes. in general? I need to know that. The, the rubber baby buggy bumpers is what I really <laughs> wanted to call the blog. That's It's what I wanted to name the blog in the first place, but I figured I had to give it a name that was something that would be more likely to pop up if somebody was searching for it or something like that because, sure. you know, it's a, it's a kind of a dry topic, but you know, in a lot of ways, I felt like rubber baby bug, buggy bumpers, ah, I knew I'd mess it up eventually, would, uh, you know, cover more of of what the intent was. Sure. I oh, love and, it. Uh, it. by the way, once again, yeah. happy birthday, Joy. Thank you. Yes, today's my birthday. I am birthday. now the uh, ultimate answer to the ultimate question of <gasps> life, the universe, and everything. So... That feels like a milestone to me. I'm going to celebrate all month. Uh, but for those of you that are new to the webinar, if you've never joined us before, so glad you're here. Thank you for joining. Uh, like I said, I'm Joy, Joy of SharePoint. If you're on the Twitter sphere, find me. Let's connect. Uh, I've been working with Microsoft products and technologies for actually over 11 years now because I'm officially old. Uh, but Stephen and I both work at Pate Group. Stephen. What do you do at Pate Group anyway? Uh, well, I do a lot of the kind of technical stuff. Uh, you know, I'm these days I'm working more on security and, you know, some of the the back end setup of things because I used to do a lot of like installations and things like that. But with the cloud, you don't need that kind of stuff as much. So it's the it's the same skill set in terms of just getting into the the back end of things and trying to make them work correctly, you know, trying to figure out how to script it to do the things that Microsoft didn't necessarily mean for you to do in the first place, but for whatever business reason, you absolutely have to do it. Uh, and then I do, you know, the occasional blog, uh, much more occasional now than I have in the past, but. Um, yeah, we have Stacy. she makes us do things. That's exactly true. You so, bet. <laughs> <laughs> That's yeah, it's very much there's there's a lot of whip cracking going on and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it's real. It's real people. All right. So, you know, we kind of do this a lot these days. I have a poll. So you should just be able to open up your camera and just scan that handy dandy little QR code there and answer some questions. I'm actually not sure. Could you move your mouse? OK, yeah. Oh, uh, oh. I just wanted to make sure because on my screen, it looked like the mouse was in the middle of it, but it actually was my mouse. Oh, it was your mouse. Huh. <laughs> That's what you get. All right. So we're going to ask some questions. Um, we kind of had some fun with these questions. I'm going to pull the form over. Usually when Richard and I do webinars, he does this part. So I'm going to do this part today. So hopefully, yes, I see responses are coming in. That's exciting. Let's see who we have. We have some IT professionals, welcome. Some managers, thank you managers for joining us. No execs, so we don't have to behave too much. Mm -hmm. All right, DLP, oh look, oh, look at that beautiful pie chart. That's fantastic. All right, let's do a refresh. Let's see if we've got anything new coming in. I wanna see more rodeo clowns in our audience. Like, do you? Get lots of IT professionals. And Maybe if we made that an option, Yeah. Uh, it would be there. That's true. Okay, that's, that's on us for not providing the option. So let's see. All of the above is a correct answer. 
Um, man, a vacation to Tahiti, though, that would be fantastic. Um, when I, Stephen and I were playing with this question here, global domination, he just ended the sentence there. Yeah, but, that, was, uh, <laughs> that was what I thought should be the the answer overall. Because if, if she had global domination, she'd have all the rest of the things. That's true. That's true. It does kind of cover it. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you for the feedback and the input. Ooh, Azure. We've got some Azure information protection goodness there. Okay. Good to Good know. Enough. Thank you. Um, don't think this is a one-time thing. I'm going to put that Q the QR code back up for just a second. Um, please feel free to go ahead and respond to that as you can. We really value your feedback, especially when it's what we can offer you to be useful for you. All right. So let's get down to it. Why are we here? Stephen, we're here because of you. Well, actually, no. In some ways, we're here because of Stacy. Um, <laughs> I wrote the blog, uh, but Stacy asked me if I would do a webinar on it. And when she asked me, I, I was like, sure, I'll do a webinar. And then I thought about it and I was like, you know, though, like, A, I have zero webinar presence. Like, I, you know, I haven't done any. We don't have a name for it. You know, any of that stuff. So maybe if I do more as we go on, I'll start doing some of them alone. But then the other thing is you and I have had this conversation about a thousand times. We've had it with mm -hmm. customers and we've had it amongst ourselves. Like, we've just, mm -hmm. like, hopped on teams and started talking about this. And so I recommended that she drag you into this little circus because you've had so much uh, exposure to the customers with these kinds of questions. And this is, while I do do more of the technical backend stuff, uh, this is the beginning of the process. This isn't the, the down and dirty nitty gritty of the technical side of this. This is the beginning that we find that a lot of people really kind of skip because they, they ask us to go a little uh, faster into the subject than is really possible. And mm -hmm. so, you know, you and I will talk about this again, and we keep having this conversation for several reasons. Uh, one of them is it's important. Very important. Uh, the other one is it isn't obvious. A lot of times people don't know where to start this conversation. They, they know they need security. They know security is is different in the cloud world. They know that it's something that maybe they haven't had time to dig into. And so, you know, we they ask this question. But then the final reason is because it's not, or it is obvious. And it's because they do know that. And a lot of times intuitively, they know the answers, but they need us mm -hmm. to go over it again. Um, because we get a lot of a lot of questions that both of us, when we hear them, we're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, you know, you don't even have to finish the sentence. I know exactly where you're going. <laughs> you know? Yep. Yep. And it's it's a little frustrating, I think, for our business users and the IT professionals that we're working with, because and I'm not saying that IT professionals and the business users think this, but we really feel after all these years and all the time that we've been in our Microsoft products it should just be magic, right? It's like everyone needs security. There are certain things we expect to be there. There's this certain degree of expectation that we have. Some of it is there, absolutely. There, There's a little bit of magic in Microsoft, I will say. Oh, that could be a whole other webinar, the magic of Microsoft. But in the real world, there's no magic, right? It's right. Blood, sweat, and tears. It's it's planning, it's talking. Like you said, you and I have hopped on teams, probably couldn't count the number of times and just said, okay, this is what came up today in a conversation or I saw this thing and go. Mm -hmm. Right? Because yeah. we're still thinking about it and planning and trying to anticipate the needs as Microsoft continues to roll out this functionality that's evergreen. Absolutely. Oh. So let's see. Let's start thinking about it. So some of this is actually kind of came out of Stephen's brain, right? <laughs> but security does always come at the cost of convenience. And I like he kind of went like a little old school 
with some of the images that are on the slides, a little medieval. But you know what? The need for security is as old as people, right? As long as people have been around, there's been a need for security. Now we're just trying to apply it to our digital assets, not our physical world. Well, and this phrase is also something that is uh, it's like an old saw in the security world. Like people always say this, mm -hmm. um, but I, I don't want people to take it too much to heart. I mean, it's, it is true to some degree. Like there are some parts of security that are going to be, you know, uh, confining, but that's not always yes. the purpose of security. You know, there are, there are pieces that we'll talk about later in here where you can set a policy to prevent something, but you can also set a policy to warn somebody of something so that when a certain thing happens or when they access something, it will just pop up a warning and say, beware, you know, this document is something that you should not be sharing with the public. This is, you know, and it can also stop them or it can give them a route to get around that security. You know, it can tell them who to contact if they really do need to do this. You know, so it's it is something that is confining to some degree, but it's confining in a way that shouldn't necessarily be choking out your business. It should be just protecting you like rubber baby buggy bumpers. Well, I can remember as you were talking through that, I can remember back in my early, my young SharePoint days, when I was fresh and optimistic, bright eyed, and uh, users would come to us because they were frustrated. A password had expired, or why do I have to log in so much? Or why is this, why is that? And one day I just went into the, my supervisor. He was an exchange administrator. And I literally just threw up my hands. I was like, can we just make SharePoint anonymous? Let's just make it anonymous. That way it's easy. And he just like, okay, come sit down. <laughs> What's going on? But yeah it's inconvenient. It's inconvenient to remember to change your password or actually let's, let's be real. Your password always expires on a Friday afternoon. So you change it and your first hour of Monday morning is horrible. I swear if I were your supervisor, I would have like a coffee maker in my office and a unicorn bug just waiting for you. Like just, I, just sitting there. <laughs> so, that so the director of in, IT, Whenever the director of IT needed a favor or needed me to do something above and beyond, he would actually bring in a gallon of coffee from Panera mm -hmm. and set it on my desk. It works, right? It works. <laughs> but yeah, security is inconvenient, but um, that's the human mentality. Mm -hmm. um, it's inconvenient to have to keep up with my keys, but I still lock my doors. Yeah, right. taking a right. shower every day is inconvenient and, you know, just doing, you know, like uh, doing things to fit into human society are inconvenient, you know, yep. but we do it anyway because it's it's the right way to do it. You know, you, you don't do want it. to you don't want to frighten your coworkers out of the building. You know, you don't want to. You know, so you have to do some things just to make society work. And security is like that on the internet. You know, there are things that you have to do. Yep. And one of the things you have to do is make a plan. And yes, you yeah. should write it down. But I would say having the plan is probably the first step. Even if you haven't started doing anything yet, the awareness, we need to sit down and we need to start with a plan. That yeah. is obvious, right? Or is it? I mean, it, it's obvious in, the, I mean, there is a, a baseline. You know, when you go into Office 365, it is designed in a lot of ways to be secure to a certain level. Uh, you know, the, the data is all encrypted at rest and in transit. You know, it's it's designed so that it's not just leaking all the time. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean that it's perfectly secure. It just means that there is a baseline. And so, you know, if you're in the process of moving to Office 365, you need the plan first. But yeah. if you're if you're watching this and you're like, you know, oh, we've been on Office 365 for like a year and a half. We don't have a written plan. You need to get one. 
you know, and you need to talk to your users to get that plan together. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is kind of about is that, you know, you do need to have a written policy, both because it's a good idea and because some things require it. Like if you want to be HIPAA compliant, if you want to, you know, comply with Sarbanes-Oxley or, you know, a dozen other of the letter salad, uh, you know, security frameworks that are out mm -hmm. there that, you know, you may be trying to meet because you're uh, a financial organization or a government organization or a healthcare organization, you're going to need a written security plan. And yep, like you have here, it has to be documented. And it has to be something that allows people to, you know, make reference to it so mm -hmm. that they can say, you know, well, the policy says this because just saying like, well, that was stupid, Dave. Why, you know, that's against our policy. What policy? You know, if, if you don't have a policy, it's like, okay, Dave did something stupid, but how is he supposed to know? He's not a security expert. You know, exactly. how and is he supposed to know? This is one of the struggles with SharePoint. It was true in 2007 and probably before then, but that's about when I came on the scene. Uh, it was true five years ago. It's true today. IT departments still, <laughs> It all facets struggle with the idea of turning over the security of SharePoint sites to, I'm going to say this word, users. Mm -hmm. Right? We do. It's hard, but that's why, talk to me, folks. Training, 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 training is part of security. Because Dave okay. can't not do that stupid thing if he doesn't know in the confines of SharePoint it's stupid. Right? Mm -hmm. Can you just share everything anonymously? Can you? Should you? Two different things. Um, the can can be controlled in the SharePoint admin portal and the OneDrive admin center. We can control can. We can't control should. Um, if Dave really thinks he should be able to do something, but the tools don't let him do that, he's going to find a way to do it outside of the tools. Processes, yeah. training, if, write if it down. you and I had a dollar for every time a customer mentions another product to do something yep. that they can do in the Office 365 suite, whatever it is. And I mean, and I'm not saying this because Office 365 is perfect and because it, oh. you know, is the best of breed for every function that it could possibly do. I'm just saying this because they've got Office 365, yeah. but we have tons of customers who are like, Sure, we have Office 365. Oh no, we don't use OneDrive. We use Dropbox, Box, Dropbox. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, uh, Google, Google Drive. Yeah, whatever. And <laughs> we're like, well, why are you doing that? And they're like, oh, well, you know, uh, it just kind of started one day. Uh, you know, somebody wanted to share this document, and they didn't. They didn't know about OneDrive, or we we hadn't moved to Office 365 yet or whatever the case, you know, maybe like they didn't know how yeah. to do it in OneDrive, but they did know how to do it in, in Dropbox because that's yep. what their Boy Scout troop uses. And right. the amount of money that companies are spending because they're not showing people what the things they already have are capable of. Yep. You know, so many companies that are using GoToMeeting and using uh, WebEx, uh, or, you know, any of a, I don't know, probably a dozen other solutions for meetings. Zoom, a good example, you know. They're using all those things, but they're already paying for Teams. Yeah. And they've already got logins. They've already got, you know, and because they didn't want to show them how that tool worked or because they didn't want to talk to them about it. Like, you get customers sometimes who are like, just don't talk about Teams. Like, like, yeah, you know, let's talk about SharePoint. Let's talk about, you know, email and all that. But just just don't mention Teams because we don't we don't want to go there yet. We don't want to confuse them. OK, but you're probably already paying for it. You're, well, you're already paying for it and it's not being used. But I guarantee you those people are chatting somewhere about work stuff somewhere. <laughs> Maybe they're only going to email. Maybe. But I have seen people talk about work-related content in Facebook Messenger. 
I came out of the government side of the world, I had to toe clenched up and thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you're talking about your proprietary information on Facebook Messenger. Mm -hmm. What? Give well, me an avenue that you can wrap your security around. And how many customers have you gone to where like they tell me a week or two before you're going to head to the customer that they have an Office 365 environment and they've been paying for the Office 365 environment for a year, two years. I think our record is like five years where they yes. and they've been paying for it all that time. And they tell us in one of our initial calls, oh, we we don't use it, though. So, you know, there's there's nothing in there. There's nothing, you know, that. There's nothing to talk about uh, as far yep. as like our migration and everything, but then they give us access and I turn a report over to you where they have like 60 teams mm -hmm. that they, they didn't know about. That, you know, yep. And that usually that selling block is mm -hmm. the security. We don't know how to make it secure, so we're not going to use it, but I guarantee you dollars to donuts, they're using other tools that aren't secure to get their job done. And that's not at the fault of the user. Um, without a vision, without a plan, the people perish. So we do have to have that plan. And I kind of thought this was a good sidebar to governance real quick. This is not a governance webinar. This is a conversation about security, but governance needs to have a place at the table today. I know we love that word governance, but you got about four things here that governance needs to be. It needs to be common sense. Steven pulled that right out of his blog. It's got to be common sense. It has to make sense. Uh, how can we train on it and explain it and get it across to the business if it just doesn't make sense? Nobody will pay any attention to it. It's got to be consumable and easy to read, not 50 pages, because I guarantee you, once you write your 50 page government's document, you probably won't even go back and read it. Right? Nobody's going to read it. So if they're not reading it, they're not consuming it, why is it even there? If you can get it down, I think one number I heard was like 14 pages is statistically the maximum number of pages people will read. Maybe, I don't know, it's gonna depend on my attention span on any given day. If I'm gonna sit down and read 14 pages and there's not a really good plot happening, sorry. Um, well and some organizations will really kick against that. Like if they're an organization that has like a, a strong IT group, like that mm -hmm. IT group will want to put in the document things like, you know, which port things happen over and what the firewall settings have to be and all that. You can have an implementation plan as well, mm -hmm. you know, but you that's link not- to it in your government's document. Absolutely. So if anybody yeah. really needs to know the details of that, but that can be a separate thing. The security yeah. document, the security policy is meant mm -hmm. to be something that somebody can read and they can be like, ooh, ooh, I shouldn't be doing this. You know, yeah. I, you know, it says right here that I can't do this. And, you know, they're like, oh, but I can do it if it's encrypted with, uh, uh, 2048 bit encryption. And if I, you know, transport it over this port with uh, this type of application, then I can do it. Or, you know, no, that's not user consumable <laughs> stuff. No, you know, that's all. something that you might want to give them an exception. Like if you need to do X, then contact this person and they can assist All the you. help desk. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Your help desk is your first line of defense. By the way, if you haven't trained your help desk on how this stuff works, just go do it now because they are your first line of defense for your users. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, if you can't enforce it, please don't write it down. This applies to all kinds of things, including permissions. Um, had some folks once I was working with awesome folks are the ones that brought me to Oklahoma five or so years ago. Uh, but in governance, they wrote down that site owners were not to modify the web parts on their home pages, on their team sites. Okay, but they're owners, so you can't enforce it. And it's their team site, it's their site. 
it no one else is going there. So that kind of falls outside of the common sense thing. We had an open conversation about it, talked through it, the reasons, the whys, and we got it to where it was more common sense. And, and we pulled out the things that weren't enforceable. It's like, is jaywalking even a law if we're not going to enforce it? Right? I mean, let's be real. Let's be real. Is it stupid to jaywalk? Are you going to get hit by a car? Odds are good. Is that a completely enforceable law? I don't know. I don't know if it is or not. That might that spark some conversation. That enforcement doesn't have to be a technical thing. Um, you know, if you do have a rule that says something like that, you know, that rule's a little iffy, I agree. You know, but mm -hmm. if you have a rule that says don't do this, then it's, you know, it's not a challenge. <laughs> it's not right. a, yeah. you know, unless you can find a way where we can't catch you, uh, you know. <laughs> You know, or or a way where we can't stop you. You know, right. it, part of the governance plan is for accountability. You mm -hmm. know, if you find out somebody has been doing it, then there has to be consequences. Even if you weren't right. able to stop them with a physical policy or a, you know, uh, a technological solution. If you find out that it happened, there needs to be, a, you know, an outcome that makes them not do it again. Right. And it should be part of advancing the goals of the company. And this applies to security as well. You know, the goal of security is our content is safe. It's not getting in the hands of the people that it shouldn't be in. Um, that's a goal. The goal isn't to lock it down so tight no one can use it. That's not the goal, right? And that's, that's back out, to the security and convenience thing. Like, you know, right. I've heard that used by IT as an excuse. Like, well, you know, security always comes at the cost of convenience. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that security should be an excuse for not doing things that make right. your business work better. Very true. Very true. And it's it's not there to hit people over the head with. Right. Uh, but all that said about governance, let's pivot back to the security piece of it. Let's talk about getting started. That's the hard part. It's the hardest part is getting started with that plan. Um, Stephen outlines this very well on his blog. I literally pulled this stuff out of his blog and put it on the slide. Um, identify the data that needs more than minimum. What, what's the, minimum in your mind? Well, the minimum is the baseline of Office 365. And so a lot of times people will say things like, well, we need all this data be, to be encrypted. Um, and we need, you know, all this data to be you know, separate from other, you know, other organizations and all that. And that's stuff that used to stop people from going into Office 365. They used to say things like, oh, well, we're never going to go to the cloud because we don't control all of the pieces. Well, Microsoft mm -hmm. has spent an enormous amount of time and effort coming up with, you know, ways to meet uh, government rules and information security rules for various industries so that you can't say that it's not possible for you to implement it. It may be less convenient in some ways, but it may also just be that you don't want to let go of the, the old way that you've been doing things. Right. Um, and so when, when it says the minimum, you know, that's just sort of like the basics of like storage of data, sending things over the internet, you know, unencrypted. So it's it's HTTP versus HTTPS. And, you know, we've always told people, you know, when we're like installing SharePoint or something, there are certain things that you should do. You know, you should you should have an SSL cert. You know, you should use, you know, uh, passwords of a certain quality. You should, you know, consider things like you know, multi-factor authentication and stuff like that. And those are all the pieces that Microsoft makes pretty easy for you to implement. I mean, mm -hmm. some of them are automatic. You you can't get Office 365 unless you use HTTPS. You just can't. Right. Um, and. Gonna, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Finish your thought and then I'm going to answer a question that I saw pop up in chat. All right. So, you know, the baseline is just, you know, this is, you know, stuff that is in a secure place going through secure transport 
That's the baseline. What do we need more than that? And a lot of organizations, the answer may be nothing, but go ahead with the question. Well, so Matthew, sorry, I didn't see this earlier, but he did ask an important question. Um, do you make that governance document public for the users to see and read along with IT? I say yes, 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 absolutely yes. Um, Cause they, if you don't know about it, how do you, how do you follow the rules? If I don't know that I can share anonymously with OneDrive, but I have to make sure that there's an expiration date, right? Or, or something like that, or that OneDrive is the tool I'm supposed to use. I'm not supposed to use OneBox or send it from my Gmail account, right? I, I can't follow that rule if I don't know it's there. So I would say absolutely yes. And I would even this, this minimum security that Steven's talking about, I would link to that in the governance document because when we're talking about security from the perspective of the organization, people want to do their job and they want to do it well. And knowing that it's secure, knowing that it's safe, giving them links. Some people will read every drop of information they can get, give it to them. Others are like, oh, if I say he says it's fine, it's fine, I'm good. And they right. don't have to click the link. Well, and yes. that's why I said you can have an implementation document that you don't have to make public. You know, sure. if if you've got well, a document well, that goes into the the deep details of how you're meeting your goals, you mm -hmm. don't have to tell them. <laughs> you know, but you need to tell them like, hey, don't email documents to people anymore. Only share them. You know, they yes. have to know that it's a it's a change in the way they do things. Mm -hmm. Uh, so you have to you have to make that policy something that is accessible in terms of a a uh, you know a baseline reader. They don't have to be a super technical person to understand right. those things. That's what that document is meant for. Yep. And his follow up is oh makes us uncomfortable to talk about this. Right. It's this is an uncomfortable question. How do you handle it if governance? policies are not being enforced by are being followed by some people but they are following other policies so you have it out there you say hey look you're not supposed to be using dropbox to share files oh well sorry it's what i'm used to mm -hmm. and that's i mean that's a tough one sometimes because a lot of times the people who don't follow the rules are the executives Mm -hmm. They're, you know, they're the ones who are like, you know, I've always used Dropbox. I'll always use Drop, Dropbox, you know, and so there can be some tough conversations there, but you need to explain why the policy is what it is. What is the problem with them using Dropbox? And in a lot of cases, the problem is non-existent. It's not really an issue, uh, but in some cases it is an issue uh discoverability you know there's a there's a legal responsibility in some organizations that they keep uh certain kinds of communications uh and they keep a record of those communications so any kind of side path for sharing information mm -hmm. with a partner or something could get you into a big pickle legally later because it looks like you were trying to get around uh keeping proper records yep. and it's yep. uh here in cincinnati where i live uh there was a scandal a few years ago minor scandal but still a scandal where a bunch of the city council people were sending text messages to each other and they were essentially doing city business through those text messages and a lot of people are like well what's the big deal well the big deal was there are sunlight laws that say when they debate these issues there have to be records. It's it's all supposed to be, you know, done in an open forum where the people know what was said. So there are no side deals. There's no, well, if you vote for this, I'll vote for that, mm -hmm. you know, and those kinds of requirements sometimes are the reason why you want to use one channel because you control that one channel. Whereas Dropbox in some cases may cost you extra money uh, as an organization. But in some cases it may not somebody may just have like a free dropbox account or whatever you know but if an executive shares something with a partner 
through Dropbox, it looks like they're trying to go around the system. And later on, when there's like an information request or like a, a legal request where you have to do uh, discovery for like the communications between you and that partner, that's a communication that didn't get recorded. And that mm -hmm. looks really bad on you. And so you have to remind the executives that sometimes those rules are there to make their lives easier later on. It's not yeah. so much about- And it's a protection for us as users too. Exactly, you know, because if you do it the way that you're supposed to do it, and then somebody says, well, you never should have sent that document. As a user, you can say, well, I had no way of knowing that. Yep. You know, and you know, that is, you know, but I did it properly. Like. You're saying I mm -hmm. shouldn't have done it, but I did it correctly. And I did it in a way that was discoverable by IT. I didn't put it on a thumb drive and carry it home. You yep. know, I did it the way I was supposed to do it. And what can come out of that is they go back and go, okay, well, we didn't define that and we haven't built the fence properly in the backyard. So it's time to go review our security policies, um, our settings and make it better. Right, that's the appropriate response to that situation. Make it better. And just like your favorite word with all governance documents, it's evergreen. It's evergreen. You got to be able, that's Microsoft 365, friends. <laughs> it's evergreen. <laughs> I can't tell, yesterday I was doing a demo and I clicked a button. I said, oh, look, this is new. It's evergreen and I'm in Teams all day, every day. I evergreen. <laughs> I found a feature that used to work in SharePoint and then stopped working and then it started working again and I sent a message to Joy, I think it was yesterday. Like it was yesterday. Hey, and I did this a happy feature dance. works again. <laughs> and I knew it was a feature that she liked, but it just it just stopped working one day and it was not working for a month or two at least. Oh uh, minimum. Yeah. It's the auto tagging when you drag and drop into a group. But mm -hmm. it works again now. Yay. All right. Well, let's talk about cleaning up. Let's talk about cleaning up uh, and, and whenever and anytime I see that phrase, I hear my mom telling me to go clean my room. Um, but we need to clean up our data too. It actually is a security risk to have too much stuff when some of it really should be archived or it should. Guess what? It's OK to delete stuff. It's OK. You should delete things on occasion. So, you know, clean up as you clean up your data you actually that helps you start identifying your content um how many times do you clean your room as a kid and you found that thing you've been looking for or you go through your junk drawer and you're like oh there's my extra iphone cable oh that's been here the whole time that happens when we clean up our libraries and our data inside of microsoft 365 we start to identify um and for folks that have legal requirements that legal requirement might be to keep certain things for a certain period of time, but the flip side of that is it needs to go away after a certain period of time. Mm -hmm. And that's another one that you may not, you're like, well, you know, what's the downside? Well, the downside is when you are getting sued and yes. there are documents laying around that you could have destroyed a couple of years ago. Well, as soon as you get the paperwork for the lawsuit, you can't destroy it now. Right. Just because it should have been destroyed two years ago, if you still have it, destroying it would be a problem, you know, but if you got rid of it on the schedule that you were supposed to, it's gone. Hunky dory. Hunky dory. Yeah. So identifying, okay, slides advanced, please. Um, identifying the minimum level of protection needed. Uh, we've talked about this quite a bit already. But I think it bears repeating again. Minimum, most of your data, probably for most of our organizations, I hope I'm not overstating that too much. The minimum probably is fine. You probably don't need to come up with a label for every type of document you have. And you're going to drive yourself crazy if you do. Um, so, if I have a castle and I need to put a moat around it, if I make that moat bigger than what I can get across in a reasonable amount of time, it's probably not super useful. And now I have a castle that I really can't use. 
So just keeping that in mind as we talk about the default Microsoft 365 security, right? It's encrypted and it's available only to those who can authenticate. Something to keep in mind if we're talking about SharePoint, because SharePoint is our document management tool in Microsoft 365. Yet SharePoint still does not do the job of authenticating people as your Active Directory, right? Does that authentication process. What SharePoint does is it authorizes after we have presented ourselves and authenticated through Azure AD. Then we get all the goodies that have been defined for us through SharePoint and Azure and whatever tool we happen to be in. So that's a level of security right there. Uh, at Pate Group, right, I have to log in to update a PowerPoint presentation. If that's my, I don't know, my TMO presentation that I do at SharePoint Saturdays and such, that's public anyway. But what about the presentations I do for my customers that has their logical architecture, right? And it has guidance and recommendations that's just focused for a specific audience. Is it annoying to have to log in for my public presentations? Sometimes, but it makes sense because it doesn't know what should and shouldn't be available to public folks. That's security. Um, we also have multi-factor authentication turned on because um, when we're not, you know, under a COVID-19 pandemic situation, we're all over the place. Uh, Steven saw a message from me the other day in Teams that I was out of the office and he was like, so are you, are you traveling again? Or are you just I was like, no, just taking a day off. But there are times when you never know where I'm going to be when I'm pinging you. And that's a, a level of security. Does it make sense to make people who are sitting in an office logging in from their desk every day to also be challenged with a multi-factor authentication code? Probably not they're behind a firewall, they're behind that, they're in that identified IP address, right? All that stuff is there. So we'll probably make an exception for that. And that's back to the, the part about things having to make sense. Um, you know, so uh, probably people who've watched these webinars before, I think we've probably mentioned it, like multi-factor authentication was something that uh, one of our people just turned on one day, like we were, we were all working and all of a sudden we started getting these prompts and we're getting an email, you know, that's like, you know, hey, I just turned on multi-factor authentication. And it worked out fine, except for, uh, you know, one of our people lived somewhere where they were getting charged for every notification of MFA. So every time it sent a, a text message with the extra code that they needed to enter, they were getting charged. The answer for them was to go in and reset it so that it was using the, the Microsoft Authenticator application to give them the code instead of it sending it through an SMS message. And that's, you know, that was a simple solution for that user. Um, but uh, Joy and I were talking about this just before the meeting today. Uh, if you're working someplace where you have a bunch of frontline workers and they're on the floor in a production facility or something, they may not have their phone with them or the phone reception may be terrible. Mm -hmm. And so you may not want to put MFA on for those users. They may just need to use their password so that they can get in quickly from any device in the, the shop floor. And, you know, they may not have their phone with them. You know, there are some, some places where, you know, the, on the, the production floors and things like that, they don't have their cell phones. They're not supposed to have their cell phones um, for security reasons and for productivity reasons and all that kind of stuff. So you can't just make a blanket like, well, you always need to use MFA. MFA is the only way that you can do anything. And then find out that that means that, you know, 3000 people have mm -hmm. to, you know, break policy to meet policy <laughs> you yeah know, exactly it has, you can't put people in a bind like that and so you have to figure out you know why you're doing what you're doing and a way to make that a workable solution for your users and i 
kind of wish we'd had that exact conversation yesterday because then on the next slide, I would have the phrase, ask yourself why. Anytime you're going to put a policy in place, ask why. Make sure you can answer the why because mm -hmm. that means you are creating something logical that's going to make sense for your business users. Um, we are going to require multi-factor authentication for anyone that's not dialing in from this or this set of IP addresses. Why? Because that means they're out and about on the go. We want there to be an extra level of security involved. The other why is because the people on those approved IP addresses, they're already here, they're in the building, they're in the office. We feel confident that their login is appropriate. Boom. And you can set and you can set policies in Office or in Microsoft 365 for that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that if you're in a physical location that is, you know, identified by the IP address as, you know, one of your your offices, mm -hmm. they don't get the multi-factor. But if they're yep. in a coffee shop, they do. They do. And you as can't well even get. Should. You can't even get fancier because Microsoft will notice things like, hey, this person logged in from a coffee shop in Van Nuys, California, like 10 minutes ago, and now they're in Gdansk, Poland, and they're trying to log in. And how's that happening? Right. Now, that can happen because of VPNs and, and remote desktops sessions and all that kind of stuff. But then it will ask more questions. It mm -hmm. will, you know, activate the MFA or it will, you know, put them through some other, you know, set of loops to make sure yep. that this is a legitimate login. And that's critical, especially, you know, we're now seeing how mobile a workforce needs to be at times. Uh, so making sure logins are legitimate is going to become more and more of a pressing issue. Um, and as we start to roll out this suite of tools that's available, creating policies that prevent us from accidentally sharing information we shouldn't is super useful. So I can teach Microsoft 365, right? What our health record number looks like, what a credit card number looks like, social security numbers, some of those are already pre-built. But you can create those policies, teach the system what, it, what things are. That way, so if you're concerned about, oh man, do we, we're a healthcare provider, do we really need people sitting there in chat having conversations with PHI, PII, PI, insert acronym here. But if you teach the system, oh, that's a social security number, you really shouldn't be chatting about social security numbers, right? You can keep people from having those conversations inappropriately. Maybe it's okay for that kind of information to be internal. Uh, but you want to have the ability to have guests inside of teams, certain teams, right? Not all the teams, that would be chaos. You can restrict chat to certain IP addresses. So if it's external, again, you can block that communication of that type of information. So there's just, there's a lot that's there, but you can't know what you need to do until you do some things. <laughs> this is where it gets fun. Um, and, and this slide is where Stephen and I really have a lot of back and forth conversations. What's next? Well, and, and we have a question that kind of is asking about this. Is there a security best practice? There are things that are best practices, mm -hmm. but that's in general. Requiring a password for login is a best practice. Can we tell you that multi-factor authentication is a best practice? No, because we don't know your particular needs, your particular situation, and your use cases. So when you start thinking about best practices, it's not a global blanket that we can just wrap around it. It's what are the best practices for you, for your business users, for your organization, and that that is a tough pill to swallow. It really, truly is. Because again, if we back up to that third or fourth slide with, with the magic, what's his name? Magic, what's his name? Uh, well, I mean, that's actually Shia LaBeouf, but uh, yeah. Doug Henning, I think, was the name of the, yeah. the inspiration. Who that's supposed to be? Yeah. <laughs> but it feels like 
SharePoint's been along, around long enough. Microsoft has been around long enough. All these things have been around long enough. Why isn't there just this thing I can turn on? Because believe it or not, we get this question all the time. And I know it probably doesn't sound super honest, but no, there's not a one size fits all or most thing we can give you because as many clients as we have, Stephen, what do you think? We probably have about 40, 45 active project teams right now. Right. Yeah, Everyone something in there. Is a little bit different. Well, that's, a, I mean, we're not saying that best practices don't exist, um, but uh, Joy, you're having a house built. I am. You know? And so there are best practices for building a house, you know? Like yeah. first you choose your materials. Are you gonna be getting a brick house? Are you going to get a house that has stucco, it has siding? You know, are you gonna use uh, wood or are you gonna use steel for the frame? Um, you know, all these things. And that's what best practices are. They're the building blocks. Mm -hmm. They're the they're the little things. So we can give you best practices about passwords. And and actually I have a blog pretty much written that'll probably be coming out in a week or two um, about passwords. What password policies are there to accomplish, what they should be, you know, because that is a best practice. But when mm -hmm. somebody says, well, what's the best practice for our security? That's where it's like, well, okay, so you guys are the third largest bank in the United States. Unless we copy what the first or second largest bank did or and to do that we either have to work there or we have to be consultants who are willing to breach uh privacy agreements with that customer like non-disclosure and all that kind of thing we can't tell you what the best practice is for your organization in your business with your restrictions we can tell you what the best practices are around some very specific areas of things and we can tell you what the best practices are for sharing a document through teams not what the security should be but we can tell you how to do it you know we can tell you like the way to share should be done this way mm -hmm. there may be another way to accomplish that but it's probably a bad idea um right and it's so it's the basics that are the best practices. It's never that whole overarching blanket of here are all the things and all you have to do is just check these boxes and you're secure. Uh, there's a, a secure score that you can have in uh, like Azure AD where you go in and it tells you what your security score is. But Microsoft was very clear from the beginning that is not a video game. It is not the highest score wins. It, it's just keeping track of all the things that are available to you that you are using. And it gives yep. you a number scoring based on that. But just turning on all of those things and having a, you know, a 9,999 uh, security score doesn't mean you or your organization are better off. You know, you may be more secure right. because you've locked it up where you can't even get to it. You know, and guess but, what's going to happen if you do that? Your users are going to go around the system. Absolutely. You know, that and is not a practice. You're going to lose money and time. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. So, so how do we get there, Joy? Uh, depending on the people that are listening to my voice right now, I'm so sorry, but go talk to your users. <laughs> And Stephen, that's not one of your number one favorite things to do sometimes, right? To go sit down and work hand in hand with people all day, every day. Well, and that's <laughs> so more because I'm a, I'm an introverted nerd than <laughs> because I don't understand the need. Um, I understand why you have to talk to your users and I very much agree that you have to talk to the users. And so when you and I talk about this, you never hear me say, Oh no, I'm with IT. Screw those guys. You know, <laughs> I never say that. You know, I, you know, I may not always want to have that conversation. Uh, just because 
sometimes I tend to not be gentle enough with users. Um, so and, sometimes they send Stephen and me together. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So take a friend. It's dangerous to go alone. Here, take this, right? Um, talk with your users. Ask them, you know, what do you do? I did this for nine hours yesterday. I sat down with several groups. What do you do in a given day? A lot of email. Who do you do that email with? What do you do in those emails? Is it internal? Is it external? Ask those questions. Do a ride along with your businesses. Find out what they need. Um, don't ask them, what do you need? Don't, don't. We actually did a webinar on this. I don't know when, um, but it was like when users go rogue, right? Mm -hmm. If you ask a, a business group, what do you need? Oh, we need to be able to collaborate. What does that mean? Uh, and, send an email. There you go. You're collaborating. Congratulations. And I'll you say know, from I'll, like the IT mm -hmm. side, it's OK to talk to Joy. Like you don't have to go desk by desk. Yeah. You know, and and talk to every user. No, you have to talk to the people who understand your business process and your business reasoning. You know, so when they say we need to be able to do this. Uh, you know, you can have the conversation with the person who brings that to you. You don't have to go and be like, all right, uh, you know, accounting has to do this. So now I'm going to have to have like an all accounting meeting where I get all of their input and I, you know, I create a chart and I do, you know, this mm -hmm. thing to make, you know, Phil happy and this thing to make Linda happy. No, you have to talk to the person who understands the overall picture of what's happening. Yeah. And a lot of times, most times that's not IT. You know, IT often thinks they know what people need to do or what people are doing, and often they don't. They don't it's really. The tip of the yeah. Mm -hmm. um, you know, actually, I don't know, about a month or so before everything got locked down, Stephen and I were on site with a client up in Ohio. And um, the way we started calling it is they had rolled out SharePoint in the past. But they just said, here, catch. And that's what we called it. They played catch. Here's SharePoint. Take it. Some sites were used. Uh, some of those sites looked like file shares gone wrong. Uh, some sites were just empty because they were like, OK, what am I supposed to do? Nobody knows, right? Because IT said, boom. If that has happened and there's kind of a bad relationship there, bad might not be the right word, but maybe maybe the users don't look at IT as a warm, cuddly, caring organization that they can go ask questions of. Right? Just build that bridge. Go talk. Find out. Ask questions. What do you struggle with? What, what do you sit here and say, good grief, it's 2020. This should be easier. Ask the question. And you will be the hero when you make that thing easier, right? And they know they can do it with confidence and they don't have to have a Dropbox login anymore. They can use OneDrive or SharePoint. Uh, but see, because we are coming up on time, yep. stay agile and keep learning. If you are at a point where you are just sick and tired of learning new things every day, I'm so sorry. But you're going to have to be learning new things, if not every day, about once a week. Feel that that's a healthy pace. Let the uh, message center in the admin center be your best friend. I try to take at least half an hour once a week. It's not a lot of time to just read through the new messages that have come through. Some stick in my brain, some don't. I'll admit, Stephen, if it says Azure, I skip it and I look for the Microsoft, the Teams, and the OneDrive because that's where I live. Mm -hmm. Right? I let you read the Azure ones and then explain it to me later when I need to know. Stephen does a lot of explaining to me when I need to know. <laughs> and vice just, versa. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's teamwork. Teamwork makes the dream work. <laughs> um, I think we probably have some questions that uh, we'll get through. I'm putting up our contact information. Stephen, I don't have any of your social network information. Are you anti-social network? Uh, no, I'm not anti-social network, but uh, I'm not on most of them, so kind of. He's an introverted nerd, remember. It's introverted nerd. It is a thing. Um, <laughs> you know, so, no, I mean, if you, you know, if you have a question about, 
you know, any of the things that we've talked about today or whatever, my email is just fine. Go ahead and send it out there. If if you're insistent that you need to talk to me through, t you know, Twitter or something, then okay. send me a message and I'll set up a Twitter as, you know, as Stephen Wilson at Pate, and then we can talk on Twitter. I think you need to do that. Um, there was a comment earlier about governance, uh, I think security and phishing emails and all that fun stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I once spent a large chunk of my life addressing <laughs> phishing emails when I worked for a government organization. Communicate, 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 and then communicate. Um, we had an email go to several members of our organization. It The name was the president of the company at gmail.com. Letting the people know that there was a problem with their password and asking for information. And a lot of people gave that information. Promise you the president of a company is never going to send you an email about work from their Gmail, Outlook, Hotmail, AOL. It's just not right. But we have to educate people that don't think to look at that. Um, could some of that be wrapped up in governance? Yes. Before sending information, make sure to look at the email address, something like that, short and sweet. And if you I have, have mm -hmm. you can come up with a plan for that. Yes, like, you can. We've had people say like, you know, well, what do we do if our mail system is down? I can't send them an email from, you know, my email address at the company, you know, come up with a plan, you know, uh, come up with like team. a, yeah, uh, you know, a Facebook group, uh, a Twitter account, something <laughs> so that when things aren't working, they know to check that. Yep. You know, yep. and you um, can put your announcements out there. Absolutely. There's ways. There's absolutely ways. Um, if you have specific questions about any of this, we've not been able to get to. Um, you're welcome to hit us up at our email addresses. Uh, at Joy's SharePoint, you will find me there on Instagram, Twitter, and even Facebook now. I'm playing with that as well, because why not? As introverted as Steven is, I am extroverted times two. Yep. So that works out well. <laughs> but thank you. Stacy. do we have any more questions? On no more questions, but I put a link to the uh, you, When You Go Rogue, or When Users Go Rogue. Uh, webinar into the chat so you can find that there have a look it was a amazing webinar that we did last year that's already was last year wow i know so weird all right fantastic well thank you so much thank you for the questions thank you for being part of the conversation uh and feel free to keep the conversation going on twitter instagram facebook and uh stacy i think after this we need to get steven on twitter okay Cool. I can do that. I, you know. <laughs> okay. He's like, I mean, I'm I'm that kind of introverted that's uh, not afraid of public action. I just don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Have a wonderful day. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>